thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's always a great honor and privilege to have the opportunity to talk with young students at universities. And I say this because uh, if you want to understand the future, then you need to talk to the next generation. And so an opportunity to engage with you about uh, the struggles for education that we experience in South Africa. And then I think to discuss how the lessons of that struggle have a relevance not only for today in our own country, but also, and this is something I've learned over the last 20 or 30 years of my experience, is that many of the fundamental problems that confront us in education, particularly public education, are getting to resemble each other more frequently across the world. And so, in large parts of the world, we witness vast inequalities in the public educational system, where essentially the children of the poor and the working class and children living in rural areas are guaranteed, guaranteed to get a totally inadequate education that will not prepare them for the challenges of the 21st century. And so I think for all of us who believe in education and see hope and possibility in education, it is vitally important that we understand the nature of these challenges and what we can do about them. Because I'm sure we are all in agreement that we can have a better world. I have dedicated my life to that purpose. And I believe very strongly that the sort of just world that most of us believe in is a possibility. But it will not happen because we talk about it. It will happen because we are willing to struggle for it. And that is the one lesson that I want to talk about uh, from our South African experience. Because, and I don't say this in any arrogant fashion, but I think that South Africa has demonstrated not only what one could do, but also what one needed to be very careful about. Because we have made mistakes in South Africa, but these mistakes have been critical in the sense that they've helped us understand what the challenges are and therefore how we need to change to bring about this better world that literally thousands of students in South Africa died for. And so, first of all, I'm going to start with uh, giving you some context, some background to the struggle for education in South Africa. Education in South Africa was deeply racist. Black children went to black schools. White children went to white schools. It, it was, that was the stark dividing line. And because of the ideology of apartheid, the apartheid state believed that education was one of its most powerful tools in subjugating black children. That was its starting point. So the architecture of the educational system was such that it perpetrated not only inequality, but deep structural racism. And this is an issue that still confronts us to this day in our country. And so one of the consequences 
of both the ideological attempts and the structuring of racism in the country was that white children received 10 times the amount that black children received for education financially. So you can work out what the consequences of that would be. Now, like all systems that attempt to dominate through both ideological control and structured financial control, the South African apartheid education system worked on the belief that this system would enable them to keep permanent control over black children. And here, in fact, is one of the most significant lessons that we've learned in our struggle for education in South Africa. And this is that despite the intentions of oppressive regimes, the people Despite the intentions of oppressive regimes, people have the capacity to resist. And so, from the 1950s till the 1990s, schools and the educational terrain became a major site of struggle. It was where the students took on the apartheid regime. This was a very powerful factor that eventually brought about the downfall of apartheid in South Africa. I mean, in addition, of course, there were political organizations, trade unions, and so on that played a critical role. But the fact that the students showed to the people of South Africa that it was possible, in fact, to take on the system gave hope and encouragement to the rest of the country. And this intensified so that by the 1980s, uh, almost half of the students would be spending their days on the streets in conflict with the security forces uh, and and in many areas, in fact, schools around the country, particularly in the urban areas, were closed down. And so you can see, in fact, this determination to bring about the end of apartheid was a new phase in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And so when Nelson Mandela was freed together with many of his comrades in 1990, one of the critical issues that confronted us was how to deal with the educational issues post-1994. And so there were a couple of things that we knew very well. First of all, we had to bring to an end the racial nature of schooling. And that uh, proved to be uh, really quite a significant struggle because racism is not something that you can just remove by writing a new law. It is part and parcel of the culture of the country. It's embedded. And racism in South Africa was structural. It was not just simply there as a sentiment. The second was, how do we deal with the inequalities in, 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 in education? Because of the patterns of spending under apartheid were so vast, how do we reallocate funds so that the education of black children began, begin to improve while obviously at the same time we couldn't deny 
children who were white an education. So we had to find a way of balancing these two issues. And then thirdly, which was quite critically important, was beginning to formulate a new curriculum. Because children under the apartheid system would have been taught rubbish. And so we had to design a new curriculum that would enable the children of South Africa to enjoy, at least uh, for the main, a common educational system. So these, in fact, proved to be challenges that, uh, in many ways, uh, when we look back over the last 25 years of our history since 1994, we find in that we are still struggling with very much the same issues. Obviously, we have made progress in a number of different aspects in the country. So we have more children in school, even though we are faced with dropouts later in the, in, in, in the system. Uh, many children who were not able to go to school are now in school. We have gender parity, almost 50% girls, 50% boys. We have, uh, um, in many, particularly in urban areas, we have many schools that now teach where you can get a good education. But the fact is that 50% of our children in South Africa receive a totally inadequate education. So what we are witnessing, in fact, is the structured inequalities get carried into the educational system, and this perpetrates the cycle of inequality that goes on from one generation to the other. So you can see, in fact, that these challenges that we faced in the 1990s, while we've advanced in some areas, but in many, we still struggle with this. And as I began to look at educational systems in many other parts of the world, I realized that these are not unusual challenges. Uh, many countries in the world that face similar situations. And so it has become important, I think, for us to begin to ask some very, very deep and critical, critical questions. Why, despite resources, despite the public, uh, at least political will in many countries, despite the public opinion in many countries, we are still struggling with the same issues, the same kind of challenges. Is it because we expect too much from education? I would argue no. I think public education is at the heart of the development of any society. So we have to begin to understand. And here I want to just mention a couple of things to, to, to get you thinking. Uh, the first is, uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the first is, how do we begin to understand the implications and impact of neoliberal practices on social spending in countries, on education in particular? Uh, if we look back at the last 20 to 30 years, we will find that in many areas, particularly in education, countries have been slipping in their commitment to equality. And I am sure and I'm convinced, in fact, that this is a major factor in our inability to deal with, because countries rhetorically express their commitment to public education. You pick up any government paper, 
and you'll find a commitment to public education. But when it comes to actually making the sort of impact to bring about greater equality in education, and it, it has been achieved uh, in, in some parts of the world, even under constraints. And so politically, it is not as if it can't be done. So the question I think that, that we've got to begin to ask ourselves is what do we do in a situation like this where, in fact, uh, politicians demonstrate a lack of will to begin reorganizing the budget so that greater amounts could be allocated to education. And so, after 50 years of my experience in education, I come around to two things. One is that when we talk about public education, we do so with a purpose in mind. And that purpose is that public education is central to the existence and vitality of democratic societies. If you, in fact, undermine public education, you are undermining democratic practices and democratic arrangements. And the issue that follows from that is that education is too important to be left just to politicians and governments. And so the voice of the public in education becomes a very, very important factor. And related to this, in fact, in other words, the participation of civil society in education is central to our ability to challenge and hold governments accountable. Because governments all over the world, if not held accountable, will behave in their own fashions. Governments share that quality across the world. And so, two notions I want to leave you with, in fact, as you think about education and your role within that. The first is for us to critically understand the role of education in the 21st century. I don't think education is there simply to enable us to get jobs. It is an important factor, but it's not just there to enable us to get jobs. I think one of the central roles of public education in any society is to cultivate the active citizen the public citizen who takes on the responsibility that is so important. Because I think what we are beginning to witness in the 21st century is the inabilities of government to deal with what appears to be intractable questions. How is it possible that 300 years of struggle and we still haven't defeated racism? How is it possible? And so the lesson for us in education is that we have to begin to push the boundaries of our understanding of public education. If we leave it to the domestic purpose of just simply training us to get better jobs, then in fact we will face a situation in many of our societies where we would have to build high walls to protect us. That's the middle class from the working class. And that, I think, is not the kind of society that many of us want. The second part that's related to this, which I leave with you as the next generation, because it's your own responsibility, I think. We haven't done so well in my generation, and perhaps you will be able to do better. <clears throat> 
the two aspects that I want to leave you to think about, in fact, is that related to the purpose, the public purpose of public education, is education as generating hope and possibility. We have to begin to find a way of bringing the outside 50% into the center. Because I can guarantee you, in fact, if we don't do that, then the next generation of the middle class will live in armed forts around the world. We have, in fact, that opportunity. And I believe South Africa demonstrates that. That when I was growing up, if you said to me, did you think you could defeat apartheid? And I would say, I would tell you then, maybe in our next generation, not this generation, but we did. In 1994, Mr. Mandela stood on the steps of government as jets and helicopters flew over. And we knew then that that was possible. But it wasn't possible without hope. And, and I'm not talking about some romantic notion here. I'm talking about hope as a practice, as a way of life. Right? It's the positive thing that sets us apart. Finally, I believe that many of us want a better world. I don't think that when we look into the future, we want to say that this is the world that we want for the next generation. And so, keeping hope and possibilities alive, learning to push the boundaries of freedom, because in many societies now, uh, liberal democracies, one of the characteristics of liberal democracies is that they open up more and more space. And we must be able, in fact, to push those boundaries even further, to become more active and taking on that responsibility to shape a better world. I know it is possible, and I know it can be done, because we have shown the world that that was possible. Thank you. Thank you.